Welcome. Welcome to this evening of remembrance, remembrance through music, poetry, testimonies, prayer. An evening where we are together and our hearts are linked. And where the memory is eternal. And with that is our desire to connect. In conclusion of this service, there will be a lesson issue from Cartman Institute by Professor Rahel Karazin, an outstanding scholar. A year in poetry, marking the anniversary of October 7th. Thank you for making time and making this a priority. To all of you who are joining us on Zoom, we're connected through the invisible link, and we feel your presence. El Malar Rahamim, God of Compassion. In a universe that lacked compassion, grant tender rest. Beneath the wings of the Shekhinah and the broken sphere of human radiance. To the souls of each and every of the injured and the violated in the horrors of the pogrom of October 7th. For the fear that fell upon each man and woman, elders, youth, and children. Our mouths do not know how to scream or put it into words. For we lament and mourn for them, for us. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these, our eyes grow, our eyes grow dim. Woe to us, for we are broken. Woe to our homes that were shattered, our souls and bodies tormented, and our faces 
darkened. Therefore, compassionate one, reveal our torment to the world and for all time. And from one end of the earth to the other, may the silenced voices utter, guard our souls in the land of life. We continue with Miriam Schechter and Andrea Pines, who's going to bring us music and soul of our people. The words of Ariel Zurayev. Dear people of Israel, when I sat down to write a song, I was speechless. What are you writing about? About the horrors we went through? Everyone knows what we went through and how many poor souls we lost. We believe with all our hearts that our strength is the people of Israel. This song is meant to restore hope and remind us that we will get through this and win together. Without words, without feelings, there is no escape from thoughts. This is an unexplained rift here. How do you write when the heart is broken? If we are a chosen people, how is such a cruel fate to strive? There are no answers. A heavy fog has now descended. Who do you turn to? The soul was wounded in battle. Shema, we, Shema Israel, we say together, hear, O Israel, we are all one. Hope is still not lost. It's impossible to describe the horrors in the world. The soul is wounded. We just want it to dance. We don't want to see mothers crying anymore. We have no other country, even if the ground below us burns. Enough of the division, enough of the hatred. They see us and take advantage of the weakness. This is the time to love, to spread hope, raise your head and smile back. Because we are all brothers, not only in arms, people of Israel are a family. We'll be victorious, there's no doubt. In history, we won all battles. The people of Israel lives. Kikulanu achim, lo rak b'milchama. Am Yisrael zo otam mishpacha. Anakul nanatzeach ve'en posrekot. Ba'historia, nitzachme bekol akrabot. Am Yisrael chai.
I'm going to ask Lynn Mitchell to come to a place where the words and knowledge of an extraordinary woman who is Lynn's best friend, it is in the memory, the honor is held. Thank you for the opportunity of remembering Vivian with, with all of you here today and on this very, very special and momentous day. Oh, sorry. Okay. My WhatsApp message link with Vivian goes cold on Saturday, October 7th at 5.56 a.m. Toronto time. Vivian, are you okay? What's going on? There was no answer. On checking with Yonatan, her son, he said that they had lost contact with her after a very, very difficult conversation while she was hiding in her safe room about an hour before. We know now that she had been murdered by then. Three days before, she had marched in a women wage peace rally in Jerusalem. A week before, we had spoken on WhatsApp, a normal yada yada conversation about our grandchildren and her plans for the fall. Two months before, Vivian, Yonatan, Chen, and his family had stayed with us in Toronto for a week while they attended her brother's son's wedding. Four months earlier, in May of 2023, Michael and I had visited Vivian on the new Israel Fund trip and had visited with her a day on the beach in Tel Aviv and then several days at her beautiful home on Kibbutz Beri, of which she was so proud and which no longer exists. We weren't sure we would be able to stay on Beri with her as Vivian and most of the kibbutz were evacuated that weekend in May of 2023 due to rockets from Islamic Jihad. But she was able to return to her home and when we walked with the, those beautiful fields with her from which you could see Gaza, she said, here it's paradise, there not so much. In 1963, we graduated from the Yiddish-speaking IL Parrot School in Winnipeg, Vivian from Togshula Day School, and me from Ovenshula Evening School. In 1965, I was the outgoing Vice President of B'nai B'rith Girls of BBYO Red River Region, and Vivian was the incoming President. Michael, too, was her lifelong friend and shared a wonderful bond with her. We double dated with Vivian and her date at his high school graduation. And in those intervening years, we had many visits with her in Israel and Canada. In 2007, on the Darche Noam trip to Israel with Rabbi Tina, we met with Vivian and she took us to the desert embroidery program of the Bedouin women in the Negev. And she and her co-director, Amal Alsana, of the Negev Institute for Peace and Economic Development spoke to us. Many of you met her then and connected with her. I know that Tina still treasures the embroidery souvenir from that trip. So that's just a very little bit about our personal connection with Vivian and her family, which goes back so many years. And while I was a close friend of Vivian, she had so many close friends all around the world, all who feel as I do tonight. But what about Vivian, the peace activist, for which she is known now around the world and has received international recognition? For her, the peace industry, as her son Yonatan called it, was not her job or her work or her volunteer activity. For her, it was a way of life. On Barry, when she was in charge of construction, 
there were workers from Gaza who were employed on the kibbutz. And in the never-ending cycle of violence, the border between Gaza and Israel would close and they would not be able to work or come into the kibbutz. Vivian, who was in charge of construction, would always, make their, would always bring their wages to the Gaza border to make sure that they were paid what they were owed. She had a very, very strong ethical sense. She drove cancer patients from Gaza to their treatments in Israel and engaged in activities with her Arab neighbors in the Negev and in Gaza. Her work for so many years as co-executive director with Amal of the Negev Institute for Peace and Economic Development was groundbreaking work for a shared society of Arabs and Jews. In 2000, Vivian took us, Michael and I, with her husband, Louis, for lunch in Gaza at the home of her friend, Issam, a leader in that community with whom she had worked for years. On October 7th, he called her from Ramallah, where he now lives, but he could not reach her either. He is now part of that peace industry, and we have, through a very circuitous route, reconnected with him and he would love to come here and address our shul and all of you and tell you about his work and about his connection to Vivian. In 2014, when she retired, she was a co-founder of Women Wage Peace, which has now grown into 50,000 members, the largest grassroots peace organization in Israel today. Women of the Sun is their partner of Arab, Israeli, and Palestinian women. They and Echo Peace Middle East are all nominated for a joint Nobel Peace Prize this year. In her peace work, Vivian spoke not only truth to power, but truth to peers, which as Shifra Brosnik writes, is a much harder and unpopular undertaking. Vivian advocated through Women Wage Peace that all viewpoints and all women were welcome in the peace tent. Equally importantly, she advocated amplifying the power of women's voices in peace negotiations, which, as you know, are absolutely absent. I've often thought about what influences prevailed on Vivian that helped her become the authentic peace activist that she was. I know that she brought to her life's work the values cultivated in the Habonin Youth Movement and the North American Jewish Students Network in the 1970s. But I like to think that her indomitable ideals in shared society, coexistence, nonviolence, feminism, and living side by side with people who were once your enemies sprouted much earlier than that. In the north end of Winnipeg, where we both grew up, we had all the protagonists of World War II living on our streets, in our neighborhoods, and in our classrooms. We had and we lived with the Germans, the Jews, the Poles, the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Hungarians, and the Japanese. And as kids, it wasn't always peachy, but we learned that life was much easier if we all got along. And we didn't have a lot of adult intervention to help us along in that process. We were left to our own devices to figure it out. In B'nai B'rith Girls, the youth movement we belonged to in our very formative years, we learned that curl girls could and did do everything and anything. We did so much in terms of trying to make our community better and in honing our skills in leadership and community activism and in organizing and having fun. Vivian was a child actor. I remember her in Red Rose Tea commercials and an early CBC drama on about Santa Claus. And I think perhaps that's where she learned to be comfortable speaking in front of large audiences and in front of crowds. But most importantly, she had the support of her parents and notably of her mother, who believed that girls could do anything and, that rein and reinforced that in Vivian. 
and I like to think that that was the Canadian side to Vivian, as her children acknowledged was always there, and she brought those uniquely Canadian values to her piecework, in addition to the fact that she spoke Hebrew with a Canadian accent. A few months ago, a group of Canadian women, of which I'm a part, established the Women Wage Peace Canada Support Group. Many, and it's those colors that I'm wearing today. Many of us knew Vivian personally and are extremely moved by her peace activism, share her ideals, and wanted to continue her work here in Canada and honor her memory and her hard work. At the moment, we have chapters evolving in Vancouver, Winnipeg, Toronto, London, Ontario, and in Montreal. We support the women wage peace ideals of demanding that the leaders of the Arab and Jewish communities negotiate a peace agreement and demand the presence of women at the negotiating table and in all aspects of the political system. Our organization is very young and fledgling, but we work closely with the other peace activist organizations who also want to live in peace and nonviolence with their Arab and Palestinian neighbors, such as Standing Together, Omdim Biachad, Heart to Heart, Canadian Friends of Peace Now, J-Space, and the New Israel Fund of Canada. Vivian's son, Yonatan, is very involved in the peace movement and is trying to take up her life's work. The family has established the Vivian Silver Legacy Scholarship, which every year will award two women, a Palestinian and a Jewish woman, who have worked towards building Arab-Jewish partnerships in Israel, promoting Israeli-Palestinian peace, advancing women to decision-making and leadership positions. And just as a note, the New, Israel, the New Israel Fund of Canada accepts tax deductible donations for this specific purpose. Here in Toronto, I'm on the steering committee of the organization and I coordinate Women Wage Peace Canada East. Ronnie Rosenberg has been so helpful in communicating with our Eastern region, sending out all our messages, but we're looking for more people to stand with us and to help. I know there are those of you here today and on Zoom who share our goal, goals, and I urge you to join with us. In 2025, with the help of a large coordinating committee, which includes my daughters and several amazing Palestinian women, with the New Israel Fund of Canada as our sponsor, we hope to promote a Vivian Silver Legacy event in her voice, where we can showcase the work that is being done towards shared society in Israel-Palestine and hopefully here in Toronto. With the support of Women Wage Peace Canada, we're trying very slowly to connect with women in the Palestinian diaspora here, and we invite you to join with us. On any given day, I'm totally overwhelmed by the work, by Vivian's loss and what has happened conflicted about everything and anything, and feel very unqualified for the task that I am participating in. But I remember Vivian's persistence and her smile, and the hope she had for peace, and for living in peace with one's neighbors. She never gave up, and I guess we won't either. I'd like to give Vivian the last word, and I quote, Social change always appears slowly, over time, like bulbs that have to mature in the soil before the plant can grow upward and start blooming. Thank you and may her memory be a blessing.
Yanuv Sarudi was one of those beautiful people who was murdered at the Nova Festival. His sister is an Israeli dancer, a friend of Israeli dance choreographer Mikhail Barzilai, and she asked him if he would find a song and create a dance in honor and memory of her brother, which he did. The song Habladal Bamechakot, the ballad of waiting women, uh, was commissioned into a dance, was created into a dance that virtually every folk dance community, I think, in the world, Ronit, maybe you could verify, it's dancing this dance now. It's a beautiful dance. And I will sing the song. <laughs> You'll find the words in the supplement, in Hebrew and in English. I should have said that first. Mark Adler, can we ask you to come forward for words of remembrance? Uh, I stand here today in profound grief, but also in gratitude for being able to honor Major Benjamin Benji Trakaniski, a defender of his people and a hero who made the ultimate sacrifice. Benji's love for his country was more than just a passion. It was his life's calling. From young age, Zionism ran through his veins. He understood that being part of Eretz Israel and Am Israel meant community, unity, and in moments of crisis, absolute selfishness. Selflessness. 
Benji was killed helping to rescue members of Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th, 10 days before his 33rd birthday. Benji was to be married to Rotem in April of 2025. In place of the usual eulogy, Rotem read out the marriage vows that she had written for the wedding that never will take place. Benji was born and raised in Herzliya to immigrant parents, Liz from England and Israel from Russia. Liz, my two brothers and I, are the third generation in a chain of friendship that spans five generations now. Benji had a sister, Sharoni, who gave birth to Adam Benji in December of 2023. My youngest brother is Benji Sandak. Benji, a professional soldier, was off duty on the morning of October 7th. He was awakened by Rotem, who had heard of the initial missile attacks on the south from the news. A major in the 7th Armored Division, Benji initially drove with colleagues to his home base in the north of Israel. When it became very clear what was transpiring in the Gaza envelope, and in Kibbutz Be'eri in particular, they sped from their base directly to the kibbutz. It was tovu v'vohu. It was disorganized and chaotic. He and his team were the first to go into the kibbutz, which was burning and overrun, and began rescuing whomever they could. The manner in which he and his team were able to extricate frightened, shocked, and panic-stricken members of the kibbutz, all the while under undiscriminate fire from terrorists, is the stuff of legends. Time and time again they went in, brought out over 80 survivors, and went in again under fire. It has been reported by a survivor how patiently and convincingly Benji managed to calm and convince a young woman to leave her protected room with him. She feared that he was a terrorist, but by removing his helmet and showing his blonde hair and blue eyes, she was convinced he was Israeli. There remains much fog as to the specific time, place, and circumstances in which Benji fell. He had sustained many wounds and was with a partner trying to extricate other wounded soldiers. It took over three days before his remains were identified. Over 1,000 people stood by Benji's side at his funeral and eulogized him, including the mayor of Kurtzlia and Yom Kippur war hero, Avigdor Kachalani. Their presence, along with so many and the military honor salute, was a testament to the magnitude of his sacrifice and the depth of the love and respect in which Benji was held. Now, just a, a moment of serendipity. At a previous conflict in Gaza, Benji found himself billeted on Kibbutz Be'eri. At one point, a member came up to him and asked him if he wanted to have a warm shower, and he obviously agreed. When he retold this story to his mother, Liz, she asked him who that person was. He couldn't remember except for the fact that she spoke with a Canadian-American accent. Liz asked her if it was Vivian Silver, and indeed it was. There are, no, there are no degrees of separation here. Dedicated to his military career, Benji was also a graduate of the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy at the Reichman University. And he spent significant time volunteering in support of Holocaust survivors and disabled children. He had a love for CrossFit and extreme physical activities, and a fundraiser, Project Benji, has been established offering a plethora of opportunities as well as recipients for tzedakah in his name. The most recent is a dedication of a ninja park in Herzliya established and bearing his name. Benji died as he lived, serving, protecting, and loving his people. Benji was a man who lived by his values, courage, honor, and love for the people of Israel. His unwavering commitment and bravery inspired those around him, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of many. May his memory be a blessing 
and may his legacy inspires us, inspire us to continue the work of building, protecting, and loving Israel, as he did every day of his life. A true hero, Yehi Zicho Baruch. This time I will tell you where it is in the supplement. On page eight in Hebrew and nine in the English, the song Rak Biachad, only together. Adi Avrahami wrote a beautiful song. There's so much amazing, sad and beautiful music that has been written since October 3rd. It was difficult to find a piece to bring forward. There were so many. Um, I brought this one mostly because I could never get through it without crying. So we'll see if I make it tonight. Um, I will also mention for the Hebrew speakers, you'll note that I've kept the feminine as it was written. So if I say Shomeret, that's why, that's the way it was written. Geshem, Shavot Ratu Vatahatsu, Azeshaloya Shuv, the Shuval Delet, Tipot Nok Shot Ruchot Shokot, Shirbli Shem, Umie Shem, O Perek Shenik Dahareshalaf, Min Misha Yagin, Agan Kulosa Gur Halef Shavu. Regas <laughs> Dima ve o dima ve o dima Nishtof hakol Venivneh mehat chala Achre hageshem Ve hasofot tiporim shokot Shir zikaron veim hadelet Tiporim trunot ochot maskeret so chalamnuchalamot, be yachad, rak be yachad, nish tov et kol aroa baholam, rak be rosh moram, nam shich mut mikan, dima be o dima, be o dima, nish tov hakol, be rosh moram, nam shich mikan, nisof et hashvari, Paset hamacha berosh muram shich mikan od lo avda hatikva dema vi od dema tishtof hakol venivne mehat chala. May I ask Susie Blackstein? Adler to come forward for your remembrance and share story with us. Another family friend. Adi Kaplun Vital. Adi Kaplun Vital was murdered at the age of 33 at her home on Kibbutz Cholit where she and her husband settled following their army service. Adi, 
who is one of four children to our friends, Yaron and Jackie, grew up in a traditional Jewish home where the values of Judaism were always a part of her thinking and practice. When joining the kibbutz, Adi and her husband, Anani, were full of idealism and were committed to family, to their kibbutz, and to their country. Adi had a large extended family in the Ottawa area where her mother was born, and Adi spent many summers at Camp Ramah with her cousins in Canada. Adi played saxophone, excelled in basketball, and performed in an Israeli dance troupe in her youth. She was an avid reader and wrote poetry. She had recently completed her master's degree, finishing an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, and she was leading a successful career in cybersecurity. Described as always being at the top of her class, Adi was portrayed by Professor Muhammad Bashudi, who worked closely with her during her master's program in desert studies, solar energy, and environmental physics as the brightest student with whom he had ever worked. Apart from these skilled accomplishments, Adi is described as someone who always made herself available to everyone, who had a good ear for listening, and who was very thoughtful, kind, generous, and inquisitive. On October 7th, Anani was on a hike with friends and was going to join with the rest of the family after his hike. Adi's mother, Jackie, was in Canada visiting with her family, and her father, Yaron, was visiting with Adi and the family and was staying in the guest house just across from Adi and Anani's house. She spoke with Anani and told him that she had heard shots that morning. She knew that she, her four-year-old son, Negev, and their four-month-old son, Eshel, were in danger, and she asked Anani over the phone to give him a refresher on how to use the M16 that she knew that they had hid away in their safe. When the terrorists entered their home and riddled the safe room with bullets, Adi bravely shot and killed one of the terrorists prior to her own murder. She saved her father's life by insisting that he stay in the guest house and not join her. Four-year-old Negev recalled that bad soldiers came to the house with drills and drilled the whole house. He said they wanted to drill his four-month-old brother, but Adi stopped them. Before she was shot, Negev recalls that Adi told them to remember that she loved them more than anything else in the whole wide world. The boys were given to Avital, a neighbor, and were taken to Gaza, but miraculously were then allowed to flee. Avital made her way back to the kibbutz where the boys were later reuni reunited with their father. The family has transformed their grief into a mission to share Adi's story with the world. To honor her memory and her values, the Ottawa Jewish Community Foundation has established the Adi Vital Kaplun JCC Sports Camp Scholarship Fund. A second scholarship has been established through the Ben Gurion University from which Adi graduated. A site has been established for donations to help Anani and the boys reestablish their lives. They're temporarily residing in Jerusalem, but they want desperately to return to the South. Another fundraiser is of shirt, t-shirts and sweatshirts with the emblem that you see up on the screen. Um, it's, uh, it, it was drawn to remind us of Adi's courage, like a lioness who protects her cubs. I wear it because people inevitably ask me what it stands for, and it gives me an opportunity to do my part 
in keeping her memory alive. And we thank you for this opportunity to help their family in the quest to keep Adi's, Adi's memory alive. I'm going to ask Aliyah Golam to come and share, stand here and share a poem with us. It's only by chance by Arid Klopstock. Okay. It's only by chance. It's only by chance that they caught you and not me. Your people is my people. Your blood is my blood. Once you were Eden, Netta, or Shani, today you are Jewish history. For the six millionth time plus one, you prove that history always repeats itself. Your body a destroyed temple and I, a bird, escaped from the, the trapper's snare, I am with you. Whenever you scream, I will scream. Thank you. At the moment, we will continue with um, candle lighting ceremony. There are seven candles that are set. I'm going to ask that the first candle be lit. We remember our brothers and sisters. Margaret Zabar, I think that's your candle. If I can ask you to come forward and uh, read a poem and then light. Remember by Rena Lavan. We remember our brothers and sisters, the loyal and faithful, the brave and courageous, whom we lost amidst the horrors of war. We remember the shining eyes, the warm embrace, the confident heart, the photo albums, the life stories, the homes built with great effort and burned in an instant. We remember the loving families, the beauty, the hope, the eyes that look upon us with trust. May the souls of those who have left us to be bound up in the bonds of life and their memory be connected to us by a thin thread of light like a bouquet of wildflowers and rainwater, squills, golden puddles, almond trees, oleanders and mulberries, laughter carried on the flights of swings, a beating heart, tenderness and compassion. May our souls be connected to theirs in deep memory and gratitude. And may we choose life. We remember and we choose life in the gentle hand extended in the thin ray of dawn, in the sprouting stem, in the breath of the earth. These words are included in your supplement on page one. Since these words should be read and reread, um, we will make sure if we have your email address to forward you this material and uh, you will be able to follow on your own as well. Second candle, I'm going to ask Lisa Cherendov to come forward. We are on page two. Vision by Chen Artsy Soror. 
Every person is obligated to see themselves as if they came out of Be'eri, out of Kfar Aza, out of Sidrot, out of Okafim. They are obligated to remember and never forget until the last day. This is not meant to cultivate fear. On the contrary, it is meant to create hope. Once again, the elderly will sit in the fields of Barry, and the streets in the city of Sidrot will be filled with children playing. The burnt houses will be repainted, the fields will be plowed, and the tomatoes will be harvested. The existential threat will be removed. This is not a prophecy of consolation. This is a plan of action. May I ask Diana Davis to come to come up? We're on page three. Written by Avital Lehman, who is the kindergarten teacher. After October 7th, she went to the Dead Sea to volunteer with the evacuated children living in hotels there. Nowadays, one has to check. In the evacuee's hotel by the Dead Sea, she carefully gathers the doll's hair with a ribbon. She attaches a sparkling pipe cleaner to the ribbon, and then she asks, tell me, am I alive? And how would they know if I were dead? What would you say to a four-year-old girl? Only the living can hug. Come, let's hug and see if we're alive. Later, she says, Tomorrow morning, let's check again. We're on page four. I'm going to ask Sarah Petrov to come forward and read the poem by Admiel Kosman. Wanted, wanted a quiet place to rest the soul, just for a few moments. Wanted a place to rest the feet, just for a few moments. Wanted a plant, leaf, stalk, or shrub that won't fold up when the soul arrives, just for a few moments. Wanted one phrase, clean, agreeable, and warm to serve as a bench, a refuge for someone close to me, a dove child, my own soul, who left the ark this morning for a few moments in the early hours and could not find a place to rest her feet. We're on page five. I'm going to ask Steve Lurie, prayer for grief and faith on the anniversary of October 7. This was written by Avi Dabush, who was ordained as a rabbi by the Beit Midrash for the Israeli rabbinate. Uh, he's one of the founders of the Negev Council and Movement of the Periphery, and he's also the executive director of the Rabbis for Human Rights. He was displaced from his home on Kibbutz Nirim on the border of Gaza after the attack on October 7th. Exalted and sanctified is the human being, the tractate of whose life in our world is coming to an end. Exalted and sanctified are all our dead on Simchat Torah 5784. Exalted and sanctified are all the dead from the war within Israel and beyond its fences and borders, all our dear friends who went into captivity and will never return, all the shattered and destroyed families who might not be joined together again, 
they are not alone. We are with them. God full of mercy dwells on high, and we who dwell in dust and our hearts full of mercy, mercy for all creatures and all creations. Like our ancestor Jacob, we pray not to die in battle, but also not to kill. Like our ancestor Abraham, we look for the righteousness within us and for the righteous in every place, as long as the light shines. I believe with complete faith, and even though it may tarry, even so, I await it every day. I believe that it is within our power to do, to repair, and to change. For someone who does not believe, this is a difficult year to live. I believe it is within our power to fall down in despair three times a day and to stand in faith four. I believe that in the end, goodness will prevail within us and around us. Believe in peace. Believe in justice. Believe in human dignity, wherever it is. Love truth and peace. Believe in the vision of the prophets and the visions of the Declaration of Independence. Believe in humanity and its fierce spirit. Believe in our shared strength to do and to change for the better. I'm going to ask Rina Arshanov, Layers of Grief, to come forward. Rabbi Arshanov, we're on page six. There is a Hasidic homily that describes three levels of grief. The first level is tears, crying, the simplest and most common way people express sorrow. The second level, slightly more elevated, is silence. The third level, which the homily describes as the greatest of all, is song. Crying expresses our pain, silence, our courage, but singing expresses our life. In song, we praise those who made our lives possible and who grant our lives meaning. Page seven, Larry Tumlin, may I ask you to come? Horizon, a poem by Gally Roberts. This is a period in which it is hard to speak of horizon. It seems that there is not anything on the horizon. And yet, when I close my eyes at night before sleep, I remember my dreams and the places I wanted to be in, my children, my loves, and I become weightless like a seagull soaring very high drawing me a line and fly in its direction. We're going to rise for the moment of silence as we watch the candle beating against the glass, asking for life, asking for our memory. And then we will continue with El Malo Achamim, Kaddish, and a song.
Remain standing for Monarch's Kaddish. Yit Kadal, Beit Kadash, Meharba, Belma, Divra, Hirute, Vayamlich Malhute, Vahayahon, Vyomachon, Vahaye, the Kol Beit Israel, Bagalau, Visman, Kari, Vemru, Yehesh, Meharba, Mivarach, Leolam, Alme, Almaya. Yid Barach, Vish Tabach, Vid Boar, Vid Romam, Vid Nase, Vid Hadar, Vid Ale, Vid Alal, Shmede Kudesha, La Ella, Min Kol Birchata, Veshirata, Tush Bechata, Venechemata, Da Miran, Belma, Vimhu, Yehe Shlama Rabba, Min Shamaya, Vehai Malenu, Vial Kol Israel, Vimhu, O se shalom bimrumav, hu ya se shalom, aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'al kol Yoshevei Tevel, ve'imhu. May the one who creates harmony above make peace for us and for all Israel and for all humanity who dwell on earth with us and let us say, please be seated.
I'm going to ask again Miriam Schechter and Andrea Pines to come up and uh, share with us a musical interlude, Am Echad.
If you turn to your supplement on page 16, we will in a moment going to rise and sing Hatikva. May our prayers be gentle and sweet. May hostages come home. May soldiers return. May hands of friendship, love, and care embrace. May our grief makes us hopeful that in the end, with upturned soil, goodness will prevail. We rise for Hatikva on page 16. It. And um, I would like to thank, on behalf of Darhe Noam's community, to all our extraordinary, courageous participants who brought the faces of young people, of people of courage who served their country and humanity. May their memories be for blessing and encourage us to work. For goodness to our dear musical elegant soulful people thank you for bringing your gift we are going to pause here we have 10 minutes or so to take a quick break for those of you who are staying at 8 o'clock the lesson with Rahel Karazin will take place, and um, you're welcome to stay, and I understand, we understand for some of you this is late, so we can move around. It will start at 8 o'clock. If you will, on your way home, get home safe.